Hello, dear friends. We haven't done a Q&A in quite a while, so I thought I would answer some questions that came in from YouTube and Facebook and emails that we get here. So let's see. Let's go right into this. I hope you have some time to spend and just hang out and relax. And maybe your question was answered. So I'm looking at the computer monitor here. First question, I'll try to keep these as short as I can. How long have you been at your current location? How many classes a week do you offer? We have been here at this dojo. We started in we started building it out in 2006. Me and my friend Gary and Mike, um, we built out the dojo. 2006, we officially opened January of 2007, and the new students started to come in then. And we've been here ever since. How many classes a week do you offer? Somewhere, I think 15, 15 to 20 per week we offer here at the dojo. That's a lot. Uh, we are a full-time school. Do you teach all of the classes at your school? I do not. I teach, uh, let's see, I teach the adult classes. I teach uh, black belt classes that we have twice a week. I teach the classical Budo class on Wednesday night, which is the historical class. I teach often the weapons class on Tuesday night. I teach the Tenchi Jin, which is the Kihon basics of Budo class on Tuesday. So I probably teach maybe 70% of classes, and I do have a staff, uh, and I have senior black belts that help me teach as well, and I have uh, people that work for me, youth coaches and youth instructors that take care of the younger kids' classes, although I do assist with those as well. Often, when we're in the middle of classes, it's very chaotic here, a lot of people coming in and out of the door, and I'm often answering questions, talking to parents, doing computer work trying to serve the community while classes are going on, but I'm always watching what's happening. How long does it take to earn a black belt under you? That really depends on each person. Everyone is individual. Average is five years, but sometimes uh, people can go longer, six, seven, even eight or nine, depending on how many days a week that you train, how dedicated you are. Obviously, if you come in once per week, it's going to double your time. Most people come in about three classes, sometimes four per week. And I've had people earn their black belt in between four and five years, but it's usually closer to five because we have several uh, levels of testing through brown belt that you have to go through. So you can be at your brown belt levels, which we have three belts of brown, white, brown, brown, black. You can be there for nine months to a year if you're failing your tests or you need to... Uh, be better at the requirements that we do require to get your black belt here. It's not an easy black belt to get. Some schools, my gosh, I have students that come in and say they got their black belt in two years, three years. To me, that's crazy. I don't understand that. But each school is different. Every school you go to has a different curriculum, different belt structure, uh, and obviously a different way to progress. Do you have firearms or art, an archery range there to practice at your dojo? No, we don't have either of those. I would love to have an archery range or firearms, forget it. To, to open a firearms range, gosh, that must be millions of dollars because you have to have so many. Um, it's just a, a massive investment. Think of just the air ventilation, how much you'd have to spend on that uh, and all of the safety protocols, so I don't have a firearms range. When I do my firearms training, it's off-site. We have several good ranges around here in southwest Ohio, uh, and that's who I frequent. And I have friends with a guy that owns a range. So, And we do outdoor firearms training as well, where we don't have to have so many restrictions. You can do fast fire or uh, rolling with a gun or um, clearing rooms hiding behind an object and shooting, moving from one to the other. It's very weird and stagnant to stand there and shoot paper targets. That's not the best training. It's better than none, but you guys that are firearms experts out there know that it's always better to move and have different things go wrong. Um, how would you draw it out of your holster and stuff? You're not allowed to do most of that stuff at a proper indoor range because of safety issues. In archery, I don't teach archery. I'm not very good at it. I mean, I can shoot a bow, but 
Kudo, I never studied very well and I don't know much about it, so I would suggest if you want to learn that, find an archery school. They're very, very hard to come by. With more and more kids being quote-unquote woke these days, do you ever get parents complaining about the dojo being too strict with etiquette? We do not. Um, matter of fact, parents want us to be more strict on their kids. Often parents will send their child to martial arts for various reasons, but uh, unless the child is ex expressly interested, which a lot are, they really just love martial arts like I did, often the child will be too timid or they, they might be too high strong and they, they need more discipline taught and we love helping the parents out here and we are all about etiquette and manners here because I believe the coddling of American society has really turned too far to the to one side and we need to bring it back so parents rather than saying you're too strict every time that we're strict meaning we hold the children accountable for their actions and we reward them for good things as well but if they they have to say yes sir yes ma'am they have to show respect to everyone at the dojo uh, all the all the etiquette that you would expect in a dojo is here uh, how they tie their belt how the uniform is where their shoes are placed children love that kind of discipline they really do they they crave they crave it they love attention from it they love to feel like they have they're doing a good job and they like when positive male and female role models are around them that are helping them develop and learn and build an identity and i would much rather have my child have an identity through the dojo than on the street you know, in some alley with his friends. Uh, because the lessons that we teach here are so good that I have so many stories of youth that started here that are now 17, 18, 19 that got into that college because they are a black belt, because of the way they present themselves. They're not arrogant, but they're very confident. They're very polite. They're very willing to help. And that is a direct result of their parenting at home and the training here at the dojo. And so many people say, I got the job, I got the job, because my, my um, employer said, you're a, you're a martial artist, you're a black belt. Well, that means you're trustworthy most of the time. Um, I know that you, can, you have a sharp eye for awareness. I know that you're polite. And they get that first job. They get into that college of their choice. And that is because they trained when they were younger. And parents love it. They love it. So no, they do not mind us being strict. They, they are counting on us to help them. The old phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, is very true. It's, it's hard enough being a single parent or a two-parent household if the father's working, the mother's working, and the child's at home too much. They need a place to go where they can develop a powerful skill set that will serve them the rest of their life. Amadalia, how many types of kicks do you teach at your school? How many types of kicks? I would say anywhere from 8 to 15. You really only need about two or three good ones. Most of the kicks at our school are not high kicks because the higher that you kick, although they can be powerful, uh, the more off balance you become if you're training in snow and ice. You know, it's very easy to kick on a mat, but try doing it like outdoors right now where it's soaking wet and raining, you're going to slip. And the higher that you kick, the more the opponent can see it. Uh, he or she could grab your leg and take you to the ground. The samurai that we base our martial art off of, the ninja, would do what we call kill the base or cut the root of the tree. By that I mean they blow the knees out with lateral shin kicks to the meniscus. Uh, they'll stomp the hips to knock you off balance. They'll crush your toes. They'll kick the groin. All of these kicks from the waist down are designed to literally cut the root of the tree so the opponent can't get up and fight you. The higher the kick, the more low probability it is to work on the street. Although we practice stomp kicking the chest, toe stabbing the stomach. Uh, I might even kick the chin once in a while because one of those can knock you out. But again, you guys know that. Any type of person who's done any type of competition, we know that you know it's to get a shot like that is one in a hundred. It's much more reliable to keep them distracted up high as you kick their shin or destroy their thigh from below. 
But to name some of the kicks, we have a stomp kick, 15 different ways, toe stabs, rising shin kicks to the groin and inner thigh, uh, things you do like backwards kicks like an uchimata, uh, toe stabbing, uh, kicking the shin, crushing the foot, um, back kicks like a horse if someone grabs you in a bear hug or something, uh, scraping the bones with your foot. Gosh, there's so many, like a crescent kick, we can do an axe kick, all kinds of different things. It's so much fun, so much fun. What year did you start martial arts? The, uh, I started in 1980, I was 10 years old, officially. And then uh, I was always interested in martial arts as a child, even from age five, six, seven, I can remember being interested, but officially went to my first karate school in 1980, which was a town over from where I lived. Uh, got my first black belt in 1987 and continued to go on then and train in Budo and other martial arts. I had black belts in several martial arts and the one that I found was the most comprehensive for me was Budo Taijutsu or Ninjutsu. Uh, and that's when I first met Hatsumi, was in 1984. Uh, started to read Mr. Hay's books in 1981. Uh, traveled at age 16 to Ohio and was traveling all over the country all through my teenage years and 20s and 30s because back then there was no internet. You had to get on a plane and spend several hundred dollars to go to a seminar for the weekend. Then you'd go home and train it with your friends or your local school. Started with Mark Davis in 1986, I think, in Boston. He runs the uh, Boston Martial Arts Center. He's a great teacher. And I've had several teachers ever since. Never stopped training or learning since age eight. What is the Tanden that you mentioned in your Judo Throws video? Well, Tanden is a Japanese principle and it just means like the, uh, the core of your body, the Hara. The Hara is like the belly area. It's the center inside of your body. It's located at the anterior of the iliac crest, which is, you have your hip and then you have your navel. It's, it's a bit below your navel, but it's inside your body. And the principle of the tanden is you move from the tanden, whichever you're doing, punching, kicking, throwing, rolling, any, everything moves from the center of your core. And that keeps your balance, your kuzushi. If, if you are punching and you're punching from up here, which in America we're very used to from boxing, you tend to bend your back and then you lose your balance. Your shoulders are way over your hips. Or if you kick, just thinking of kicking with your leg, you will lose your balance backwards to the side. But if you punch and kick, use keeping your legs underneath you and using your body as one powerful weapon, which we call Tai Ken, using your body as one weapon, your punches, your kicks are not only more powerful, you're not going to lose your balance as easily. There's way more power in your kicks and hits. So you move from the Tanden. I always talk about playing chess. Constantly we talk about chess when we are rolling on the floor or, or striking targets. Everything you do, you're like a chess piece. You are the rook and you move this way or you're the bishop and you move that way. What that does is it, it keeps your balance very solid rather than leaning in to hit the opponent or leaning back and losing your balance when someone's punching you, moving your body in unison with your tanden. And this isn't just in our martial arts, it's in most Japanese martial arts, karate, aikido, judo, they all talk about the tanden, it's that, it's that important. And it really is um, an interesting concept. Silver Elf, 1987s. Any thoughts on 2020? How are you dealing with it? Do you ever get depressed at all? Silver Elf. 2020 has been a hard year for everybody. We can all agree. But at the same time, the positive part is, look, I'm alive. You're alive. The fact that we are living at all is one in a billion chances. I never lose the aspect of knowing how lucky we are to be alive. So I never wish a, w a year away. I never wish time to go faster and say, I hate this year, I wish it was over. Because I'm telling you, when you're on your deathbed, when you're 75, you are gonna wish that you had more what? Money? No. 
time. You're going to want more time with your family and friends to enjoy this beautiful gift of a life that we have. So yes, 2000 has been a struggle for everybody. My father died in April. Massive pain. Uh, but at the same time, every day that I wake up, I feel lucky to be alive. Again, the staggering odds. And if you look at geological time, my gosh, our lives aren't even registered. It's such a blink of an eye. Everybody's life. Grandparents die. You die. Your parents die. Your children are going to die. Everybody goes through this quick cycle of life. Having focusing on that through the martial arts, I don't find myself getting depressed because I'm always training with friends and socializing and talking about issues here we have. Uh, when you talk at, with friends before and after class at your dojo, it's very hard to uh, feel down. You're hitting targets, you're rolling around, you feel young, you're exercising, you're working toward goals so you have purpose and, and, and meaning in your life. You meet the most powerful and wonderful individuals that are like-minded and want to bring you up in life rather than drag you down like most people. So 2020, I deal with it just like every other year. As problems come in our life, we deal with them, which is what our martial art is about. Adaptation, going with the flow, uh, being patient, and having the fortitude when bad things happen to get through it. If someone knocks you down a hundred times, you get up 101. You never give up. You never quit. You don't give up. Uh, and depression, we, I call it, my youth students, an invisible armor that we have. When you train enough, things like insults and punches and uh, offense, uh, it just doesn't work very well because you have this invisible armor that you're wearing from your training. It's when you stop training, and the, the minute that I stop training, even if I have, like I had yesterday off, and last night I was just itching to get back into the dojo this morning to train. It's when you take time off that you find the depression, the anger, the sadness just kind of flood in. And there's many reasons for that, not just because you don't train, but that's definitely a huge part as far as when I talk to people about it. When they don't train, they feel listless and purposeless. They have to get back to doing something. And it just doesn't, it's not just martial arts. It can be anything that you do. Your family might be your source of purpose. It's wonderful your community, uh, going to the gym and lifting weights might be your purpose, playing a sport, playing a musical instrument, spending time with your pets. I, I don't know what it might be for you, but for me, the, the core of everything is the martial arts, and without it, I can't answer where I would be, but I would definitely be more susceptible to the uh, negative part of life that can easily become our thought pattern kind of goes off the, the last one. Do you teach about death in your lectures? Because martial arts deals with death all the time. I really don't lecture, um, Heather. The last lecture I did officially was in 2009 out in Los Angeles. And the lecture was on dealing with science and meditation and how meditation is being more proven by science. Uh, not the, um, you know, as far as meditation goes, it's being more and more agreed upon that uh, it does focus your mind, it does keep you calm and more stress-free without any supernatural mumbo-jumbo that, that can be easily pulled into meditation. It's not about that. It's about centering your mind, which is Tanden. It's about uh, dealing with issues in our lives as best we can, learning how to ask for help, and being self-reliant often rather than complain about something. I'm going to sit and think about it and logically analyze it and then get through it by taking the right choices and steps in my life that will overcome whatever hurdle is being thrown at me. Uh, we don't really talk about death too much in the dojo because that's a personal issue with people. We talk about, you know, martial arts is about taking lives and you can, you can really kill someone easily or hurt someone. So we talk about responsibility, especially with the children, constantly talking about cause and effect and what will happen if you punch a bully at school and you have to, what will happen to you? We talk about that, but as far as death, um, go back to my last answer. Uh, it's, uh, we think of, I think about it constantly, and I don't think it's morbid at all. Like in the West, a lot of people, the Puritan societies, like to sweep death under the carpet and never talk about it. It's like it's a bad thing to talk about. To me, it's the most important question of all. Never mind what we think 
we believe happens after death. No one knows that, uh, but we know what happens during the process of death. So to study it and read about it, I think is very exciting and cool because I, I, I hope, hope that I'll be comfortable with that process when it comes. Or it could come tonight, all of us. We walk out the door, get hit by a car, or wake, uh, go to sleep tonight, never wake up. Uh, we're heading that way. And to, to think it's morbid or weird to talk about, I think that's weird not to talk about it. It's something that the more you talk about it, the more you become comfortable with it. And everything that's, you know, born, everything that's created is going to disappear. So we've been planning on our death since the day we were born, right? Liam, I love your Taikan albums. Thank you, Liam. I use them while training and lifting weights. Are there any plans on making a Taikan 5? I don't know, Liam. Those four albums of all that music, that's a lot. Um, I, I have no plans right now to make a new one. I don't know how many songs are on those albums. It's probably 10 to 15 on each. That's 40, 60 songs. That's a lot of taiko drums that you can work out to. The shamisen, the koto harp. All of those Japanese instrumentals that I composed, that, that is enough for a lifetime. I didn't think I was going to do a taiken too, but taiken was popular. People asked me to do a Taiken 2, and I did the third, third, and a fourth a few years ago. That sold 25,000 albums. But Taiken 5, I don't have any plans to. I just did an album called Good Old Days, which is uh, cover songs from the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and 2000s, but mostly the 80s. Cover songs where I could sing and play electric guitar, because I used to have a band. Um, so for me to do that, that took a year of my life to make that album. It's 37 cover songs that I did from all type of different bands and uh, artists. That was a blast because I haven't sang in so long. Uh, and to use my voice again and just get the guitars out and the drums and the bass guitar and the piano and just, just rock away, that was so much fun. But right now I'm taking a break because I just finished that album and I don't have any plans yet on a Taikan. I did start working a little bit on a guitar album. I got out my classical guitar and my steel string guitar, and I, I, I'm working on that. So that I might do a guitar instrumental album next. That'll be my 34th CD. But thank you, Liam. I appreciate that. Now, these questions come up a lot in our videos. The following people in the last two weeks, uh, Broken Bones, Bohemia 333, Hundred Quid, uh, Dao De Dong, <laughs> Golden Devs, Aiden, Al Jester, Trumpet Man 97, Nuan, Win. Uh, they all ask how I can get a sword on that video that we did about swords. We've done a lot of sword videos. Uh, the one about the Japanese history and the sword, the history of the martial arts, that video was kind of went viral. I don't know why. It's certainly not one of my best videos, but it has over 350,000 views, I think. So I get questions all the time. Where did you get the swords in that video? The answer is Google. I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not being facetious. Google. I collect swords. I don't have that. Well, I have more than one should have. But a real collector will have hundreds. I have over 100 swords. But I research it. I go to Google. I go to whatever. And I, I, I look up on eBay for swords. I, I look for sword smiths in China and Japan and uh, Singapore and uh, Europe, Germany, France, Canada. There, there are great forges here in America that make swords and I just see what catches my eye and I order swords. A lot of the times I order swords for people. They're looking for a specific sword. My students, I help them choose out either a Shinken Lai blade or an Eito, a, a, a non-sharp blade for our training. So I often resell swords. I have a whole two racks of swords available at the front desk that people can buy. But I Googled all this stuff. So to ask where I got a certain sword, I can't answer you. You just have to Google, maybe uh, see what it looks like, and then go on and research. Everything, so many answers in our life can be answered by internet research. And I find a lot of people just ask the question without wanting to do the research. So my advice is don't ask the question before you research. Research your butt off and I almost guarantee you'll find the answer that you're looking for rather than just asking the person who made the video. 
because you're going to learn more when you research. If you just ask somebody and they, they give you the answer, you're not really learning that much. But if you if you go out and search, you'll you'll learn much more, and you'll become a better uh, student of sword collecting. Jag three eighteen comments: Why the hell are you? Tra where are you traveling? Where a sword is gonna save your life? L LOL. Try a Glock. The art aspect of this is beautiful, but let's be realistic: there aren't sword fights anymore. Well, Jag, I agree and disagree. You're right about uh, there aren't many sword fights around. But there are people who look at the news, do attack each other with swords. Uh, and you're right, a gun is better for self-defense. I agree with you, my friend. But you're missing the whole point. The reason why we train with swords is not just to train with swords, to be a better martial artist. You have to train with weapons or you're not getting a complete self-defense system. Yes, it's... It can be unrealistic some at some point, but we're learning timing and distancing and how to use uh, anything in our hand, whether it's a phone, a cell phone, a book, a pen. People live in a fantasy world where they think that if they've watched some martial arts movies like John Wick or something, that they have those skills. You do not. You have to go to a school and work your butt off and train to have those skills. They are not something you can imagine. And I get so many people that are like, why bother with the sword? It's so stupid. It's like, no, you're missing the point. Life is about learning. And if you sit at home, you're not learning anything. You have to get out and experience martial arts. You have to get in the class. You have to do stand-up fighting and sitting fighting and ground fighting and weapons and mental training. If you just focus on one, you're going to be a completely unbalanced martial artist. When we use swords in class, it's not just because it's so darn fun. We're learning history, where it comes from, how to control ourselves. There's so many aspects of working with a sword that are going to improve your budo. If you dismiss things so lightly and just say, I'm just going to pull my gun out, I don't think you really understand what martial arts or self-protection is about. First of all, you have to get to your gun, and if it's holstered, I'll be on you like a fly on crap in about 10, sec 10 feet away. You better get your gun out quick because an experienced person with a knife or a grappler, you can't even imagine trying to get to your gun before they're going to be on top of you. And guess what? They have the element of surprise, which will almost always beat reaction time. Yes, a gun is fantastic. I, I have a license to carry. I practice. But I also am realistic enough to know that I have to get to my gun first. And if I'm, you know, I'm wearing a jacket or something, or I'm impeded in any way, or the guy's got his arms around my waist, forget it. You better know some unarmed self-defense, or you're going to be in big trouble. Emu2 comments, I started in 1987 with the Bujinkan. Two years later, the dojo moved into another town. And I had the ability to get there, or I had no ability to get there. Now, over 30 years later, I restarted and I feel so good after a lesson. That's great. I'm also in Shoshin. I wanted to learn more, but I'm angry I wasted so much time. Thank you for your great work. Emu, I don't, please don't be angry with wasting your time. Life just got in the way of your training, and that happens to most people. Do you guys have any idea how rare it is for someone to be able to stick to the training for more than five years? 90 something percent and I know this from talking to all kinds of school owners around the world the odds are staggering how few people will ever become an expert at martial arts 90 something percent will quit and I have students all the time that say oh I'm the next disciple and I'm gonna be here for 30 years and sure enough two years later they disappear for some reason don't feel bad you started training in 1987 you stopped for a long time but the point is as you restarted you went back. So now you don't have regret anymore. Now you have a purpose. And you, you're excited, so you didn't think you were too old, which you're never too old to learn martial arts. You didn't waste your time. You just focused on other areas. Now you're back in training. That's great. Can you balance your training with your life? I hope so, because most people cannot. You have to be able to Put your training on an important pedestal where it's that important to you that you will shift your life around to spend a couple hours a week at the dojo. To me, there's no excuse why anyone out there 
can't spend two, three, four hours a week for self-protection for you and your family. Because look at how much time we spend sleeping in the bathroom, taking showers, out in the yard, uh, literally s scanning our computers and phones, playing video games. There's no reason. It's just a matter of managing your time and remembering why you started to training, finding the joy and the love and the fun in your martial art training. And it will always be one of the top five priorities. Family's most important, children, work, making money. But uh, if you can keep your martial art training somewhere around five or six in your priority list, you can become an expert. But congratulations on you starting again. That's really wonderful and I wish you the best of luck. How's everybody doing? You guys sleeping yet? I love talking about martial arts and I hope that you do too out there. If you're still watching, you clearly do. I am so glad to see a Bujinkan Shihan address that ridiculous straight arm ski punch that they leave out there in space. Nobody fights that way, IMO, in my opinion. Thanks for keeping it real. Thank you. Yeah, we, we address that punch quite often here because it can be very unrealistic. The reason many dojos train that punch is to coordinate your power with your legs. And by doing those long ski extended punches, you are you're teaching, you're getting muscle memory of how to use your legs with your punches so that you're not just using your arms, which is very fast but very weak. When you can put your legs in with your punch, it's so much more powerful and it'll knock someone down. And that's the whole point of that lunging ski. In Japan, when I was there, the problem is, is that's they, they always attack that way, almost always, and that is very bad, very bad. Because it's setting up the next whole generation of students that that's how people fight. And yes, when you were in armor and you had swords and you had 60 extra pounds, you would have to use your whole body and you would have to extend because of the way the armor was designed. It's hard to hook punch in armor when you have a sode shoulder plate here that's hitting you in the face. So we do practice with that lunging ski on Wednesday we do our old classical budo class because that's what it's about but almost always we do hook punches, uh, shoot fighting, uh, grapples, bear hugs, headlocks, multiple quick punches, three or four hook punches coming in, haymakers, sucker punches, anything you're going to encounter on a dark alley in, in uh, urban America you're going to find here at the dojo that we train. We respect where it comes from, but we rip apart the old techniques to make sure that they're not outdated and that we can beautifully translate and invite them into the 21st century so that they're practical enough to defend on the street. I can't imagine the embarrassment of sending a black belt out there that wouldn't know how to fight. They must know how to defend themselves against all kinds of attacks from all different cultures and times in history. Sensei Norcross, I live in Texas. I am hooked on watching your ROP paintings, uh, relaxation oil paintings. You are the Bob Ross of martial arts. Thank you. Uh, what got you started in painting? Have you ever met him? Uh, were you one of his students? I want to paint, but I suck at it. Any advice from Adam in Texas? Adam, um, I love Bob Ross, and I love that this, I don't know if you can say this has to do with martial arts, but it does. I'm so happy to see Bob Ross getting a new generation of people that love him. He's like the Mr. Rogers of art, isn't he? He has a wonderful voice. I grew up coming home from school as a latchkey kid in the 70s and 80s, and uh, parents were working, so latchkey means that we were expected to come home from school to an empty house. We would get the key, unlock the door, come in, and take care of ourselves from... 2.30 to 5.30 or wherever till our parents got home from work. And that's how we raised ourselves. If you had an older brother or sister, they might be there to help uh, make you a snack or something. But we used to watch Bob Ross. One of the wonderful memories I have with my father was him watching Bob Ross on PBS and I would sit there and watch with him. I started painting from the Bob Ross style around 1982. I think I was about 12, maybe a little earlier. And my parents supported. I said to my dad, can I paint? And he said, you can do anything you want, son. And that's what I love about him, was always supporting me. And I, he, we got a Bob Ross kit. 
uh, he built an easel because he was a master carpenter. And in my basement, I started to paint like Bob Ross and William Alexander, who was Bob Ross's teacher, started to paint, got better at it, uh, started to sell paintings at restaurants and up in Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, stopped painting for probably 20 years when I was really focused on martial arts. I dropped that style and painted, didn't paint at all. Sold everything. Uh, got back into painting probably about five years ago and started the relaxation oil painting series which you can watch on YouTube. I'm still terrible at painting but I love the Bob Ross style. I never met him. I've met some of the teachers of his but I never met him. Uh, he died 1996, I think, of cancer. Uh, but I never met him. Would love to have met him. And I love to paint. Bring it back to martial arts. Painting has to do with Budo. It really does. Any type of art. Those of you out there who paint, draw, who write books, who um, maybe you create video games, maybe you uh, play music, you play an instrument, you're in a band. That is all connected to martial arts. They are all arts, and therefore, you have hard styles of arts like martial arts, and you have soft arts like poetry and writing and music, and they, they coincide. They're the, the yin yang, they're the yin yo. You really should balance yourself from the brute part of it to also the uh, softer part, because they really go hand in hand. And I'm proud to say I'm a geek, I'm a gamer, I am a painter, I'm an artist, I'm a musician, and I'm a martial artist. And Bob Ross was a role model of mine, a hero, someone who I could look up to and someone that made us feel good as kids after school. He was our uncle from three to five in the afternoon when our parents weren't home. And I appreciate you watching those videos, Adam. If you suck at painting, which you wrote, my advice is just keep doing it. It's like anything else. Practice the large P word. Practice, practice, practice. And even if you practice, you're still going to do crappy paintings. But one out of ten might be really good. And then, therefore, you get confidence and you get better. Watch other artists. Watch like Kevin Hill on YouTube and um, Chuck Black and some of these artists that are so good at that wet on wet style. And there are several others uh, that, that have the Bob Ross style that are way, way better than I am that, that paint. Watch them. Study them. I do. I love watching videos of other artists because it makes me a better artist to see how much better I can be. They inspire me. But good luck. Good luck, Adam. Have you ever choked out a student or been choked out? The answer is yes and yes. I don't see chokes being taught on YouTube and ninjutsu. Well, that's false. They are taught. What does it feel like? Um... You don't feel anything when you're choked out. You go unconscious. So it's like you have a fit, an epileptic fit or something. You just Your brain shuts down. You go to sleep. Uh, I've been choked out at least twice, maybe three or four times. But again, my memory is faint because when I was doing jujitsu and rolling and stuff and competing much more, I was much younger. I was in my 20s and early 30s. Uh, that's very hard to make that last because your body gets older and changes so you can't it's very difficult to c compete and roll when you're much older but yeah I choked out mm, seven or eight times people it's really easy to do once you get that hold that haraka jime or that whatever it might be the rear naked choke you can choke someone out in eight seconds sometimes it might be as much as 15 depending on their blood pressure age and health and all that but we're very careful here at the dojo when we train those type of rear, rear chokes and ground chokes, um, nightmare chokes. We're very careful that uh, you tap early or you don't even put full pressure on. If I'm teaching and I'm choking someone, I'll put full pressure, but only for a second or two. And I know how long it takes to choke somebody out, so we're very, very careful. Um, it's very rare to choke someone out in a good school uh, if you're watching for those types of incidents. However, in jiu-jitsu schools, people get choked out much more because they concentrate on grappling. I don't recommend it. You know, you're always worried. You're more worried choking someone out than you are being choked. That's because you think that they're not gonna wake up, they're gonna die if you choke them out. I've never heard of anyone dying from it unless you hold it forever, obviously, or way longer. 
But if someone goes unconscious and you let go and their eyes are rolled back and they're twitching, uh, there are ways to, um, to get them back again, but I've never seen anyone die from it or heard of it. Uh, your body is really good about resetting. It's like a computer. You turn it off, you restart it. You have to sit them up, you pat them on the back or lift their feet in some cases, uh, and they come right out and they don't remember anything, but you're more embarrassed to choke someone out because you're scared that they'll get hurt. When you yourself are choked out, you just wake up with your friends usually laughing at you and you're like, what happened? They're like, oh, Mark over there just choked you out. Oh, I don't remember. That was cool. Let's do it again. That's, that's how we used to roll when we were younger. But uh, be very careful with that stuff. These jimei, these shimei chokes that we do were designed on the battlefield to put someone to sleep forever. So I can't say that enough. Be careful of safety when you're dealing with chokes at your school. Outbound Flight writes, that was an awesome lesson, Sensei Norcross. Would love it one day if you would just visit our Atemi Ryu Jiu-Jitsu school in Miami. We have Kenjutsu also. Thank you, Outbound Flight. I appreciate that. Atemi Ryu Jiu-Jitsu in Miami. Shout out to you guys. I hope you're doing well. And if I'm ever in Miami, I will definitely check out your school. Thank you very much. RoboLord12 writes, are you a gamer? Yes, the answer, Robo Lord. Yeah, I started in the, with Pong in the 70s and Atari 2600 and ColecoVision and Intellivision and all of those things. I love video games. I don't have time now to play. Um, I do own a PS4, but I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm lucky to get one new game a year. And the older that I get, I only play about 15 minutes before I kind of get bored or I want to get up and do something. But uh, I'm all for gaming to relax and um, kind of de-stress and uh, escape for a while. I was never the type of gamer that could sit there for hours and hours and play a game. But I could, I, as a kid, I could play for four or five. Uh, I don't, I couldn't play longer than that. Have you played GOT? Any thoughts? GOT. I don't. I think you mean not Game of Thrones. Ghost of Tsushima. Yes, I have played part of that game. I didn't finish it, but that game is good, and the sword fighting in it is actually very good. That was a real sleeper hit, wasn't it? They didn't expect to sell that many copies of Ghost of Tsushima, and all of a sudden it, it became one of the best games of 2020. So I am a gamer. I love gamers. We have a lot of gamers that uh, train here, uh, and some of them are real badasses, some of these guys that come in and train here. Star Wars or Lord of the Rings? Ooh, that's a, that's going to open a can of worms. Star Wars or Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings, for me, over Star Wars. I grew up with the first three, well, we used to call them the first three Star Wars movies. I don't know what, four, five, and six now, I guess. Yeah, those original movies were, gosh, the movie theaters were packed back then, and you were, you would see the movie, and you'd go back the next day and see it again. And the lines would go out around the building for Star Wars. It changed everything. Star Wars and um, Close Encounters both. I'm not a big fan of the new Star Wars movies. I, uh, you know, Bad Robot gets involved with Star Trek and Star Wars, and they're gonna. I think they've destroyed those franchises. This is my opinion now. Might be a little controversial, maybe not. But you get Bad Robot involved, and my gosh, they don't stick with the books, or they just rehash all of that wonderful old stuff. Star Wars is such a rich, fantastical environment. Why would you go and rehash old characters when you have an entire solar system and galaxy of new and exciting stories that you could do? And the last three I thought were just a mess and they tried to please the, the people rather than go with their gut feeling, which would have been something called original scripts, better directors that took chances, uh, and the same with Star Trek. What happened to Star Trek? Gosh. Gosh, Wrath of Khan. How do you top that? But Lord of the Rings, awesome. Peter Jackson's version. I don't know how the Amazon version will be that's coming out next year. Again, if J.J. Abrams gets involved, it's going to be in trouble. Uh, I hope that it's really good. It's supposedly the most expensive thing ever made is the Lord of the Rings being filmed right now. I just hope that they don't copy Peter Jackson's version. Maybe they'll go back to the Cimmerillion and pull some older stuff out. 
and it will all depend on staying true to the books, um, good writing, good writing, good writing. But I love those movies. Who is your favorite martial arts action hero? I have a few. Uh, Shintaro Katsu, who played the original Zatuichi, he was awesome. I have all of those on DVD, and I love Shintaro Katsu. He was Zatsuichi. Toma Saburo Wakayama, who's actually um, Katsu's brother in real life, who played Lone Wolf and Cub series. Those of you who love manga and anime know of that series. Those, I think there were five original movies. Lone Wolf and Cub with Baby Cart. Oh my gosh, those were awesome. In the 1980s, all that blood and gore. As a, as a teenager, I was all over that stuff. Uh, we used to go out and pretend we were the guy with the baby cart. <laughs> I love those movies. Uh, Toshiro Mifune, how can you not? I have a signed photo with him right there. He is the samurai of Japan, and I think most people would agree. He's like the Clint Eastwood of of Chambada movies. Toshiro Mifune in anything is just, his screen presence is off the chart good. My gosh, Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, all of those. He was just fantastic. Koji Yakusho from the 13 Assassins movie, a lot of you guys would have seen. I loved him in that. 13 Assassins is one of the best samurai movies I have seen in the last decades uh, that I can remember. Had some faults to it, but that was a great movie. But again, it's a rehash of Seven Samurai. They all are, aren't they? But Koji Yakusho is a great actor. He played the leader of the, um, the 13 Assassins. What a great screen presence. Shokosugi, of course. Shokosugi, there's a signed autograph. He's awesome from the 1980s, all of those cheesy movies. Enter the Ninja was one of the biggest influences on my martial art life. Uh, Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3, The Domination, uh, Pray for Death, all of those great cheesy 1980s ninja movies was what inspired me to become a martial art teacher. And to this day, I can still sit there. And if they come on TV, I will watch those through and through. All of the, the bad parts and the good parts and the bad acting. But Shoko Sugi, he had such passion for the, those roles. Even though he was kind of a karate guy in ninja clothing. Gosh, I loved, I loved those movies. Those are my favorites. I like all the others. I like Bruce Lee, Jet Li. Um, all those guys are good, but... Those ones I mentioned were the ones that inspired me. Alan Arctech, or, or Artechi. My katana fits too tightly in the saya. Is there anything to do about that? If your sword is having a tough time coming out of the, the scabbard of the saya, it's meant to be tight because when you're running, you don't want the sword to fall out. Or if you're doing a front roll with your weapon, you don't want it to come out and cut you. So you want it to be tight. If it's too loose, that's actually not good. So my advice is, if it's too tight, draw it more. The more you draw it, it's going to wear away that wood, and it will naturally become looser. And if it's too loose, you can shim it. It's very, it's an art form to go in and shim the inside of the mouth, the koiguchi. But you can shim the mouth of the saya so that it tightens again. All this stuff can be fixed. But my suggestion, and it's a fun one, if, if it's too tight, Alan, is to practice 100,000 cuts. By the time you get to that 10,000 mark, that sigh will be nice and loose for you. Uh, and it'll develop your hand strength. A lot of people, I, I test people a lot, they can't even pop the sword out because they're not strong in their hands or their fingers. So to be able to pop it with your thumb is actually quite difficult. It takes a lot of practice. Good luck, Alan. V Vigo from Gothenburg, Sweden. Vigo. Vigo means war. Uh, you mentioned that you collect swords. Oh, I do. Do you have any new ones that we could see? I have a Ryujin Fujiwara, but I am saving up for the Kengo 1095 steel sword. Can you show us some of yours? Vigo, yes. I'm going to take a break. I have to run to the door there and then uh, get a package, but... When I come back, I will show you guys, if you want to hang around for a few more minutes, a couple of new swords that I got in, okay? So I'll be back in one moment. 
Okay, guys, let me show you a couple of new swords that got here. So this is an EI. EI is a non-sharp sword for Eido or practice drawing. This is a beautiful one. This was made in Japan. So that has a nice kind of brownish gold wrap. It's got the battle wrap here, which is when they wrap the middle. Cool looking Manuki there. It's got the black Same. Good furniture on this one. Very interesting super guard. Interesting shape here. Very different type of design. And this is an aluminum alloy sword, so there's it's not sharp, but it's it's quite beautiful. So you can see the detail here of the Hamon line. That groove at the top is called the uh, the bow e. Interesting sword. Nice kisaki there. So this is non-sharp. This is good for practicing your draws, your cuts, or fencing, or doing kenjutsu with other practitioners. You're not going to injure each other. However, be careful because the tips of these are always sharp, so you have to grind them. I have a grinding wheel at home where I grind it down. But this is a beautiful furnitured sword here. Now, because it's aluminum alloy, it will bend, so you don't want to clash these together too hard because that sword is very bendable. It's not stainless steel or it's not any good quality steel here. But this is about, it's about a $500 sword here, which you could order from Japan. I find that Japanese prices are far higher than China, of course, so you're going to pay a premium if you get that from Japan. Just know that up front, Japanese swords are way overpriced in my opinion. It's a beautiful one here. This one is Shinken, it's sharp, it's a live blade. This has a brown Tsukuito here, which is made of leather. So the leather is a higher quality normally than the cotton. Interesting butt cap here. I don't know if that focuses or not, it looks like a flower petal. Super guard with some more golden flowers painted on there. Black and ornate. I like the Saya on this one where it has this ribbing that goes all the way down. Gets wider and wider as it goes. Nice black lacquer here. Sage was interested. This cord here has the black and brown. It's a nice feature. So this blade here is razor sharp, very careful when drawing this. Look at the hamon on that, isn't that gorgeous? This is a handmade, hand-forged sword. Someone spent a lot of time on this one. You wouldn't want that coming at you in a fight. Very interesting kisaki here, look how long that is. That's a beautiful, looks like a shark fin here. Again, a gorgeous sword here. Isn't that nice? I have done some cutting with this one, so I've done some Tameshigiri, and this cuts like butter through bamboo, mats of any kind. Just a beautiful high quality katana here that one you would pay about 400 maybe 500 depending on where you get it from not an interesting color there very different unusual again these aren't something you're going to find at your local flea market these have to be ordered here's one i ordered from china and again, don't think that a Chinese blade is a bad blade. They've, they've cornered the market on swords. They're cheaper. Uh, they have more in stock than Japan. And they're really doing a good job at taking the swordsmith secrets and applying them. So here's one with the brownish gold Tsukito. Interesting cap here. 
I don't know what that is, just a decorative movement. Same here is white. This is uh, made of ray skin or the stomach of a stingray or sometimes shark skin. And the reason they use it is because it has a lot of dimples in there and the dimples hold the wrapping tightly. So it's like sandpaper, it's, it's rough in that same there. So this is a beautiful one. It has another interesting saya here. It's just got ribbing halfway down and then it's got a nice teardrop finish. Interesting Musashi guard here, the Suba. I guess was made famous by Miyamoto Musashi here. It's very light, lightweight, so this changes the weight of the sword here. So let's check out the blade on this one. This has a straight cloud line or a straight hamon on the ha, the blade. And that you don't see too often. Often they're, they're wavy, but this one is quite straight. Nice blade here. I don't know how long this one is. Some beautiful design to this one. And this one is quite sharp. Wouldn't want to use this in practice at your dojo. It's a longer handle than normal. That's probably a 12 inch, maybe more long handle. Longer the handle, the better leverage you tend to have and the better balance point. The distal temper on this is pretty good. It starts thicker and gets thinner as the blade goes wide. So that's quite a beautiful sword here. Nice. This one I nicknamed the Earth Sword. Earth. I don't know if you've seen this one before, but it has a natural wood scabbard. Nice piano finish here. Isn't that beautiful? Just a nice polished wood saya here. Hence the name Earth Sword, all made of natural wood, natural brown, brown handle, white same. The Manuki in here, I don't know, they look like flowers or something. Let's see what the Suba looks like. It's pretty plain, it looks like it could be copper or bronze and it's got a flower and a little butterfly there. Beautiful sword. I can't remember if this one's sharp or not, let's check. Mm. Yeah, this one's sharp. Not really a visible hamon on this one, but it is polished. Nice sword there. This one has kind of a naginata groove there. So this part is very th thick and then it tapers to very thin blade here. So this takes a lot of the extra weight off the blade when they cut this part out. Plus with the Bohi blood groove, it really is, this is a very, very light sword, very light. But might break a bit easier if you hit it. Beautiful piece here. So that's called the Earth Katana. These are all for sale. Customers, I often trade swords and I have a lot of students that buy these from me or I special order swords for them. Look at this one. Isn't that beautiful? Silver handle, gray here. That has an eagle there. Can you see the eagle? Battle wrap. Black skin underneath. Nice gold kashira there. Collar has gold 
embossed leaf here. Subagard has waves and koi fish on it. Hope you can see that detail, that's very ornate. Very unusual coloring here. Just a beautiful weapon. The Saya is golden yellow here. Gray cord there. Beautiful. Different. I love unusual swords that are uncommon. Let's see how sharp this one is. Siniaito. So this is a non-sharp sword, so you could use this in class to practice with. Just a beautiful piece of art here. No visible hum online. Nice blade there. Cool, huh? Boy, I love this stuff. Ever since I was a child, I was just fascinated. Excellent. And we have this here. This is a. This is the uh, the Elven sword here. This I got off eBay. It might be a golden Oriole. I'm not sure. Look at the guard on that. It has this black kind of weed and grass on it. High lacquer polish there. This has a blue handle. Gorgeous blue wrapping there. The cap is rounded, specially made. And that looks like it has some bamboo or grass on here. This could be a golden orchid, I'm not sure. I think this sword runs 800 or more dollars, perhaps over a thousand. What I love about this, aside from the blue coloring here, which looks like something Lothlorien or something, look at this, look at the end of that. You don't often see a Saya that has this ornate ending on here. Another hand painted kind of flower here. Look at the curve on that. Isn't that unusual? This is a very thin blade, if I remember. It's sharp as anything and very thin. Again, it looks elven to me, like something Legolas might carry. Look how beautiful that blade is. Very light, very dexterous. This could be used two-handed, one-handed. Just a beautiful sword. Absolutely beautiful. Very, very sharp. So those are a couple of swords that I acquired recently. And if you're interested in swords, just go on Google, go on eBay, search around. You get what you pay for. If you pay $50, you're going to get a terrible sword. If you pay $500, you're going to get medium quality. Some swords are well over 3000 some are up to $30,000 if you want a real old, perfect quality sword. I have a feeling that the new swords are actually much better made, better metal, and would hold up better than the old swords. That's my opinion. We're too good at chemistry now. So people out there who specialize in metallurgy understand that the quality of steel now is just much better. In my opinion, these swords are very, very good for battle. Very well made. I would trust any of those. I get a question quite often, how should I store my swords on my rack? And that's kind of a personal opinion. A lot of people disagree how to do it. Uh, usually in times of peace, the sword handle is to the left. And if you feel threatened, times of war, direct threat to your household, often they'll put the sword handle to the right. Traditionally that is so that you could draw it out quickly if you were walking by the sword on the wall. Just that extra two or three seconds, you don't have to take the sword off, you can just draw it quickly and leave the saya right on the, um, the rack. 
this could save your life. So if you feel threatened or you're, I don't know, think someone's always going to attack you, you might want to keep your sword here on the right. For our dojo, we keep it on the left because we're not at war with anybody. We're very peaceful. Now, if you have children around, this is a trick that I recommend. I wasn't taught this, but if you have the guard on the outside, the sword can be drawn easily. So if you have children, I recommend putting the guard on the inside here. That will keep the sword from being drawn out by a child who might be walking by. Now obviously the child can lift the sword and draw it, but that takes some strength and some height. So if you have children around, I recommend putting the suba on the inside here, or keeping it in a sword bag even. But that little tip here will keep you from drawing the sword. Obviously, adults, you can leave it right there. Okay, that's it for today, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this little show and tell of swords. If you're like me, then you love these things. Remember, they're a weapon of war, so don't treat them with too much respect. They're meant to be destroyed. They're meant to be like a carpenter's hammer. So don't treat them like heirlooms. If you break them, bash them, Get them rusty, make them worn in. These are, these are weapons of war. They're not something to be just gawked at on the wall. For goodness sake, use them. That's my opinion. Some people disagree, but these are utilitarian. Use them. They're meant to be used. In other words, take them out in the woods. Chop stuff up. It's fun. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much for joining me. Make sure you like and subscribe to the video, share it, all that good stuff. For more free videos we'll have every week here at the Dojo Martial Arts. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.